G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy Podcast. The world is hopefully starting to open up soon, Busher, and the Performance Package 4.0 from Manscaped is here to help you get ready. Inside the Performance Package, you'll find the Lawn Bomber 4.0 Trimmer, you'll find the Weird Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, like below, the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, the Crop Reviver Ball Toner. I can whip those out if you'd like. Also the product. I was going to say, what are we talking about there? <laughs> this is your pathway to two luscious balls. Plus you'll get two free gifts, the performance box of briefs and the shed travel bag. It's a nice little purse for your missus to put your balls in later. As we hopefully enter this post-quarantine world, this package is the perfect package for your package and peak performance in whatever sport you desire. Even pool. <laughs> the brand new Lawnmower 4.0 is here to take the podium. This fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to the advanced skin safe technology. You're a grooming accident. <laughs> hey. Bush, the 4.0 lawnmower has a 7000 RPM motor, a new multi function on off switch Ooh. that the 3.0 didn't have. It has a travel lock, and it gives you the ability to turn on the LED spotlight, which is different to the 3.0. Apparently it's a 4K LED spotlight. Mmm, full resolution on those nuts. Oh yeah, that's what you need. Did I also mention this trimmer is waterproof, so you can, you know, go to town in the shower. I mean shaving, Jesus. <laughs> the package also comes with the weed whacker to chop your worst weeds up in both your nose and your ear, which is an underrated consideration. The weed whacker is also waterproof and uses an over 9,000 RPM, actually sorry, it's exactly 9,000 RPM, motored 360 degree rotary dual blade system. The nose and ear hair trimmer provides proprietary skin safe technology which helps nick snags and tugs in those delicate holes. Remember guys, through True Footy, you can head to the website manscaped.com and you can get 20% off and free shipping these elite products if you simply use the code TRUEFOOTY20, all caps, all one word, at checkout. That's 20% off and free shipping, which is a lovely deal. Let's get into the podcast. Alright, g'day guys. Welcome back to another True Footy podcast. This time I am joined by... Uh, well, I know you originally as Nightmare Chris, but you're also known by many as Chris Dory from ESPN, and perhaps more recently on YouTube as the AFL Draft Expert. Welcome, Chris. How are you? Thanks, Jesse. Good. Thanks for having me. Going well. Yeah, that's good, mate. That's good. Um, so I discovered you back in about 2009, uh, back on Big Footy. I don't know how many people on the YouTube scene also overlap with people who look at Big Footy, but there's a huge online community. Uh, that is Big Footy, a Big Footy, uh, the fo- uh, one of the biggest, I'd say the biggest online football forum going around. Um, when did you start posting on Big Footy as kind of a the draft expert, as that you've kind of positioned as that now? When did that sort of start? Sure. So I started in two thousand and nine. So um, funnily enough, actually during my year twelve exams, got a bit bored, discovered the website, and um, yeah, sort of started posting about it from there. And then really, sort of probably twenty ten, I really got heavily into it, started going to games. Pretty much every week and just yeah watching as much junior footy as i could yeah i was amazed to learn that you're actually a very similar age to me because you sort of write like someone a lot, lot older and you know a bit more life experience but um what uh what drew you to the draft specifically because certainly now but even more, more especially back in like you know 2009 or whatever it was that is quite a niche part of football what is it that drew you to the draft as such yeah so for me i always had an interest in the list management space i did even in primary school as a kid, just growing up, sort of all these fantasy trades, I'd love to have this guy on my team. So I might have liked Aaron Sanderlands, my team wants a Ruckman, and he was still young at the time. So that sort of concept. And I thought from there, the draft was sort of that next extension of that interest. So then I really started following that to have sort of a more holistic sort of understanding of the list management space and really everything that's going on, just almost like wanting to be that sort of general manager of sorts, having played the old NBA games and all those dynasty modes and what have you. So... Um, yeah, I wanted to sort of do the same in my own sort of mind with footy. So, um, yeah, the draft was sort of that natural extension. I, in my research, I don't think I've actually watched the video, but I feel like you've got a video called AFL 2007. Was it like a lesson in list management? What, what was the premise of that? Yeah, so it was sort of a bit like that. So I, I love the old AFL games from the PS2 generation. And on there, you sort of could keep going season after season after season, make your trades, draft your guys. So yeah, actually, that did actually play a slight part. So thanks to the old um, AFL games for that. So yeah. yeah, it sort of did play a part. But yeah, in that video, it was sort of looking at sort of in that sort of snapshot of time 2007, who would be the players sort of going forward that I'd take. 
So for yeah. like those that have continued on and had great success that are either still playing or just retired. So who you'd get the most value from, basically. Yeah, that's cool. There's um, it's it's a funny thing. Like so certain people are so drawn to the list management side of things and trading, and I think it's even reflected in. Um, I think you were saying it's the same with ESPN, but on YouTube, I certainly noticed there's an explosion of interest around drafts and trading. And myself and a lot of my friends are we the sort of people who play FIFA, not to play Ultimate Team, but we do the the manager mode <laughs> because we simply love that side of things as well. So it's cool that you sort of went from um being sort of like a I'd say casual football fan to, to sort of becoming a sort of a, the draft expert as such when that kind of, I'd imagine on Bigfoot, he didn't really exist in that space, but you've become kind of a source of knowledge and information around the draft for, like I said, over a decade, like I've been following your work for however long it's been. Uh, I think I joined Bigfooty in 2009. So that's why that, that year comes to me. But, um, Eventually, you started doing some work for ESPN in that the drafting and, and trading list management sort of space of AFL. How did that opportunity come about? Yeah, so that came about through um, actually getting noticed on Bigfooty. So um, over the years, I've probably averaged somewhere around the 400 to 500,000 sort of range in terms of view count overall in the threads. And I'd have, it could be something like, say, three or 4,000, maybe 5,000 comments within the thread. So getting those sorts of numbers... Um, that would have certainly helped. But um, yeah, my manager at ESPN, and this was right when ESPN was launching in Australia, um, he was a long-time follower of um, what I'd been writing. And over the journey, I'd had a few offers to, I guess, start with some websites where just p- people just really off the street sort of approached me and said, hey, do you want to start a website? I, I declined those opportunities. But um, when ESPN came calling, I'm um, just being a big NBA fan, knowing the ESPN brand, I thought, hey, let's do this. Let's do good of an opportunity. Never considered sports journalism at all. Never thought about writing, never rated myself as a writer growing up, honestly. So um, that was a surprise to me at the time, but yeah, it's worked really well. And um, yeah, it's been a really successful move that I've really enjoyed. That's cool. Your, your story is an interesting one where instead of, you know, setting out for the goal of getting noticed or, or you know, working in the, in the sports media industry, someone like myself, I'm, I'm actively trying to get there, but it's cool that you sort of did it almost as a hobby at first, and then you were, did such a good job that even though you weren't necessarily pushing for it, you got recognized uh, for it as well. Um, you're also on YouTube now. Um, what inspired you to make that transition, and, and how's that all going? Yeah, sure. So last year with the lockdowns in Melbourne, obviously, there wasn't too much happening. I was getting forward, forward because there wasn't really any junior footy happening in Victoria. So I thought, hey, this is an opportunity just to develop a new skill. So um in in my year off last year it wasn't a full year off we still had footy happening in the other states but i had a bit more time really just to read books learn things about myself and from there i decided because i've got the writing skills what if i develop some sort of video skills and on websites whether it's espn afl.com i guess there's more of a push to create more video content maybe do some podcasts those sorts of things so i guess it's an opportunity to one sort of develop my skill set rounded out in that capacity, but also to share some content that may not necessarily go up on ESPN, just as something extra for those readers that have been loyal to me over the years and just want that something a little bit extra. So I thought I'd do that there. Yeah, it's awesome. I do like it. You you really delve into some niche topics as well on your YouTube channel, which uh, which I think is great because um, this space is obviously still in its infancy. So someone who's uh, doing quite analytical work, it's uh, it's quite refreshing. Um, do you want to give it a bit of a plug? I didn't even mention the, the name of the YouTube channel and the types of content. Why don't you tell us about it? Yeah, sure. So AFL Draft Expert is my channel. So um, yeah, it'd be great if you subscribe. The more subscribers, the more content I'll be producing. Um, but yeah, it's mostly draft focused content, a bit of trade stuff. Um, the start of the season, I might do some super coach and um, AFL fantasy sort of content as well. And it's really just almost, in some respects, it's content that doesn't make ESPN, but it's also some additional stuff. So um, ESPN each year is an example. They'll only ask for my top 20 power rankings. I think probably because I go on a bit with my profiles and want to go into too much depth. Um, but it means that I can really go, okay, who are the next 21 to 50 or even out to sort of 80 who would be my sort of names that I think are somewhat draftable and are worth at least discussing sort of drafting. So it just gives me that opportunity to go a little bit deeper and give a little bit more, I guess, as you were saying, niche knowledge and a bit of research into different areas that don't necessarily get discussed, but I think probably should be looked at a bit more. Yeah, I did notice that about that about you. you. You did something clever with your you do your top twenty rankings, like you said, and then you uploaded the fifty to YouTube as a, a YouTube exclusive. That that was clever. I did like that. 
Um, so yeah, definitely can wholeheartedly recommend you going check out that channel. I'll, I'll leave the links to your work in the description of this video as well. But uh, I've just sort of been adding some context as to who you are for this podcast because we are going to delve into the 2021 draft um, because you're you know one of the best sources on the internet for, for this exact thing. So before we get into that, I do want to know you've been doing this for you know a decade or whatever it's been now. Have there been any? You, you sort of you do your power rankings every year, um, and then you do your phantom drafts separately as well. So you have your a personal opinion on, on who the the best talents are, and then you sort of have a draft where you predict more or less where they're going to go. But in terms of your rankings, I notice you're not afraid to sort of buck the trend and, and just pick the guys that you think uh, are in that order, which is really interesting. Sometimes you'll sort of have a, a, a an academy player from Queensland like uh, like this year as well. I've noticed you got that as well in your top twenty, but you know Toomey might not necessarily pick that up, but uh, it's a long-winded way of asking, are there any pat- uh, particular sort of wins in the past that, that stick out for you in terms of you rated this player correctly, other people maybe didn't see the talent and they've turned out to be a good player? Yeah, sure. There have been quite a number over the years and I've actually created a video dedicated to this. So it's a hits and misses video. It goes for three and a half hours. So <laughs> oh my goodness. To skip through it. Um, but yeah, I really go extensively into that there and really list out really all those hits, all those misses. And really from those misses, I've taken those as, I guess, opportunities to learn and keep improving my craft. And I also really wanted to delve into in that video, I guess those opportunities for improvement, that progression over time that I've made. Um, But for some quick hits, um, Noah Bolter, I rated as the sixth best talent in his draft. He went pick 25. Um, Others top of mind, um, Petrarca, I rated as the top pick. He went number two. Um, Clayton Oliver, I rate as, as second after Hopper. He went pick four. Um, Tom Lynch, I thought was a top six pick. He went pick 11. Um, so you've got those sort of stars. But then there's also, I guess, your likes of Ben Brown. You've got um, Anthony McDonald, Tip and Woody, Jordan Butts, who I've rated really highly years even before they were drafted. So Jordan Butts, I had either 19 or 20, and then he was rookie the next year. So um, that's another recent success there. Yeah, the Ben Brown in particular one, I think you, you actually... If I'm not mistaken, did you pick him in your, your rankings like years before he was actually drafted? Is that the case? So yeah, in both yeah. 2010 and 2011, he was top, he would have been top 30, top 40 in both years. Um, and, and then I think it was, so it was 2010, 2011, I rated him. And then 2013, he eventually got picked up. So, mm, uh, and he point. really got picked up off a move to Victoria playing in the VFL where he got that, I guess, greater exposure in front of more scouts. His the scouts don't really look at the Tasmanian leagues too extensively because there isn't, relatively speaking, as much talent over there. And if they're good, then they typically come over. And we saw that with um, Jackson Callow actually moving to the sample this year and um, getting picked mid-season draft. So that sort of thing can happen. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, is the, what about an inverse example where perhaps you didn't rate a player as highly as the consensus seemed to be and, again, were proven correct? Yeah, sure. So um, Paddy McCartan is one where I would have rated him around pick five or six, and he was obviously a pick one. So I was really worried, given he had di- has, has diabetes. I thought that was a real red flag and a bit of a worry. And he was he's, he's quite short for a key forward as well, around a 193. So I was a bit worried there might not quite be as much upside there. Um, for some others, um, Josh Shackey, he was a pick two. I had him around seven. Um, John O'Rourke, I had outside my top 10, same with um, Lockie Plowman, and they were picks two and three, respectively. Um, and I tend to pride myself actually a bit more on, I guess, those that go really early, and I rate quite a lot later, and I feel like I'd overlook them for other talents. So, um, yeah, they're the sort of types I really enjoy almost the most in some respects as those wins. Yeah, I like that. I like that. The reason I asked that as well, just to sort of gain a bit of context, because you have got a few rankings that sort of buck the uh, the consensus trend in this draft as well, but we'll get to that a little later on. Let's talk about the 2021 draft generally. Um, in terms of a whole talent pool, how do you think the depth and the sort of top end quality would compare to previous drafts? Would you say it's shallow or is it relatively deep? Um, so the top two are terrific. So um, Jason Horn, Francis and Nick Dacos, they could be top 10 midfielders in the competition. So they're fantastic. Um, from there, the next three or four, again, pretty good. Um, but then from there, I find it really becomes pretty sort of even. So all the way through to pretty much pick 40, I think it's pretty even. So um, there is quite a bit of depth this year, though I feel like probably mid to late first round, there'll be quite a lot of misses relative to most years. So... Um, but it's a good midfielders draft. Um, there's a few interesting dynamics there. 
Um, but I think the Victorians, a bit like last year as well, will be quite hit and miss. And you almost need some level of conservatism towards your selecting of the Victorian talent, given they weren't playing last year and we only really got the first half of this year seeing them. So that definitely plays a part. Yeah, that raises an interesting point because obviously this is the second year in a row uh, where COVID's had a massive impact on the on the kids drafting. And, you know, we talked about it last year in terms of how, um, you know, how holding high picks may not be uh, as valuable as it once were because of the limited exposure of kids not playing football for a long period of time. But in this case as well, it's kids that have not played football for two years almost because, the you know, the, un- the bottom ages the previous year. Uh, do you, is that may, mainly why you think that it may not be a good year to, okay, say picks one, two, and three will be strong this year, but is that uh, sort of the, the thread you're pulling out there is because of the limited exposure uh, makes it hard to take a punt on a Victorian kid? Yeah, there is a bit of that. And it's just really, there's a really distinct evenness where I know in going through, and this is a, another plug for Big Footy, but um, every year we run the official Big Footy Phantom draft. And really, I could feel the strength of all those players going through 20 through 40, where there wasn't really much that's different to those that are actually going inside the top 20. And I think it'll actually play out pretty similar on draft day, where it's just really so level. And it's really hard to pick one guy over the other. It's really splitting hairs. So, um, like, you'll find between even now and my next um, uh, Power Rankings update, because I keep watching through more games, reviewing old games, um, there'll be still quite a number of changes still, even at this stage. So all the way through that sort of top 40, roughly. So, Yeah, interesting. Uh, as a hypothetical, do you think uh, if your club held a pick, say, five or six in this year's draft, do you think you would almost prefer picks 17 and 18 instead, just so you get two bites of the apple for based on that logic? Yeah, look, five and six I'd be reasonably comfortable with. I'm feeling increasingly there are some players around that range I'd be comfortable with. So maybe a Josh Ward I quite like, um, a Neil Erasmus. I think they're both really good midfielders and they project really good long term. Um, Probably late first round, if I had picks around there, I'd actually be more inclined to move it into the second round, get a bit of value, whether it means I can move up in next year's draft or maybe get additional picks in that sort of 20 to 40 range. I think that's a real value sweet spot just based on at least the talents I particularly like and those that I think could be available in that range. I don't think necessarily that 10 to 20 range is the spot I'd want to be in. So um, to answer your original question, I wouldn't necessarily move a pick seven down. But if I was, say, Richmond with a pick, say, 15 or whatever is they're holding, I'd be very happy moving that into the second round and maybe even moving up next year. And say Geelong's draft position with all those picks between 20 and 40, I I think they're in the best position. I would love drafting for them this year. If there was one team I could draft for, would be Geelong, just based on where I see the value this year. Yeah, I think I think they've got like you know picks in the mid to late twenties and maybe early thirties as well. They've got a host of those. They're a club that were sort of linked to maybe trading up the order, but when you say mm-hmm. say it like that, yeah, they, maybe they're quite happy. Comfortable, and that's just me based on my evaluation. Clubs because they're all going to have different orders. Um, they might have very different opinions, and they might have specific guys they want to target in the first round that um they'd really like to move up to. So it really depends. But um, if I'm a Geelong, I'd love to get say a Leek Alier just as, in my opinion, the best key defender in the draft and someone I'd almost pick top 10 where it's just he really sort of fits all everything you want, where he's just that high leaper, incredible intercept mark, um, has the rapid rate of development. So all the signs are there that he's going to be a really good footballer. And I'm not sure everyone necessarily rates him, but I think second round he'll go and he'd be a great get for a job. I like that. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, he's another one of those players that you've ranked particularly highly. I think you've got him at number nine in terms of your ranking as it currently I'll sits. around that point, yeah. Yeah, Sorry. well, so big endorsement. <laughs> um, on that sort of a tangent note, do, what do you think is the strongest draft that you've covered? Because you've been doing it for so long now. Um, is it, I'll have a stab and say 2018. Is that something you'd agree with? Um, certainly in terms of top end talent, I would agree 2018 is the best top end I've ever seen, but every draft has its different dynamics where you've got some drafts that are just so incredibly deep and then you've got others that have the top end talent. So, and really starting this from 2009 and I, I really got into the draft having watched the, um, 2008, um, Tuck Cup grand final where still side bottom got his 30 touches, 10 goals. Um, But, yeah, there hasn't been really from 2009 onwards that one draft. Like, I could look at 2009 having the likes of Dusty, Fife, Gorn, fantastic top end, and then you've got others that are just that much deeper. So um, 
I, I'm sort of being a fence sitter and I don't like being a fence sitter, but it's hard to say there's one draft during that period that's that much better because you've had those compromised years. If um, 2011 wasn't compromised with all those guys sort of joining GWS before the draft um, with the likes of your Trelaw, Cameron, Shield, that might be a different story. That might be the best during that period. But yeah, apologies for being a fence sitter. No, that's all yeah, right. That's so, so unique and different. So yeah, that's and true. That, there was that's one a really draft good point. where I think it might have been, say, I think it was 2017, but there were so many Bruckman drafted that are so good where you've not only got Tim English, but you've got Rowan Marshall. You've got, um, you have um, Darcy, Sam Darcy. So you've got, I think, about five different Ruckman that are really capable. Um, so they're all different is really the key. And you just need to play into the dynamics of a particular draft and understand what's good about that draft. So this year, there's a heap of really good midfielders. So um, you've got that. But, um, the next year, say, you might get a few more key positioners. So you really want to play to the strengths of that draft. Yeah, interesting. Do you, uh, on that, you, you mentioned it's probably more of a midfielder's draft. Uh, how would you generally rate the uh, the tall talent? I'm guessing relatively weak. Is it not a good year to be on the market for a key forward, for instance? I think a lot of clubs will overpay. So I find typically there's a tendency for clubs to overpay for key position talent, particularly those from Victoria. Um, and I think this year will be another of those years where we just get a lot of key positioners going just a bit too high, where... If people are talking about the likes of, say, a Mac Andrew or maybe a Josh Gibkes's top five picks, I, I think there's probably a bit too much of an emphasis on the tools. So um, I'd be picking them quite a way back because just the midfielders are just that good this year comparatively. Um, I think that's really where the value is, particularly early, but even as we progress through the draft. Um, key defenders, I think, will be OK. I think the mature age options in particular are really strong, but I wouldn't be wanting a key forward this year. I'd try and put that on the back burner if possible. And wait until next year if that's my biggest name yeah interesting one especially on the uh, on the rucks as we see so often these days you know quality rucks get traded for absolute peanuts even if they don't appear to be quality rucks at the time they get turned into quality players like a, a tom hickey for example is a, a recent example that burns me but um yeah, yeah. so that, that explains why you, i guess you wouldn't necessarily you'd want to be really sure about a top ruck talent obviously luke jackson's the shiny example of what happens when you get it right um but obviously um yeah, generally speaking, there's value in, in leaving it a little bit later. Let's talk about the the top kids in this draft because this is a uh, – generally I feel – I don't know how you feel, but most years there's, there's a bit more of a consensus on who's the number one pick, and whereas this year it seems like there's two factions. Mm -hmm. Between uh, Nick Dacos, of course, um, a player that's close to your heart, I'm sure, as a Collingwood fan, and Jason Horn francis in terms of your opinion, who do you think is the number one player? Yeah, so I actually um, wrote an article around this time last week, actually, um, covering exactly that topic. Um, so my my cons well, my eventual pick was actually Horn Francis is the better, based really around, I guess, the defensive foundations in his game are just the best I've seen in terms of all the pressure acts, how he tackles, how aggressive he is. I really like his impact per possession, and he just really steps up on the big stage. So I'm um, seeing that Sandful final, um, just his very last game of the year, even though it was a losing game, just the way he took over, he was playing to a best in the sand full level. So, um, and look, if you're a fantasy player, pick Nick Dacos before you do Francis. But um, yeah, I'd be going Horn Francis first, certainly, just based on, I guess, how well he plays and how dominant he is at his best. That's the slight separation, but there's no meaningful separation between the two. You could go either way and you'd be stoked having either at your footy club. That's right. The uh, in particular the the production, the output from Dacos when he was playing this year was insane. It was like a couple of goals a game and thirty five plus posies. It's uh, I think it's it was thirty six and two. So wow. like if you compare that, and I, I touched upon this in the article, but um, if you compare that to the likes of say a Sam Walsh or a Matt Rowler's points of comparison, who also played in the NAB League, well they were getting thirty two and thirty disposals respectively in less than a goal a game. So. Um, in terms of production, you've got Dacos even on a level above them, which is really just insane to think about. But um, he was a very high usage player where he'd really be looked towards really almost every time you sort of could. So um, that does sort of play into sort of a bit of stat padding as well. Yeah, that's true. That makes sense. I guess maybe from a more of a casual draft uh, fan, um, for pe people who may not have seen too much of these fellas, how, would you give a, a, a play excuse me, a play comparison of each of these players so that people can sort of visualise the different sort of players that we're dealing with here? 
Sure. So a Horn Francis, I almost look at as a bit of a Toby Green. So um, Toby Green actually is a junior. He was a midfielder rather than a forward. And it's interesting. He actually made such a positive transition forward. But um, with a Horn Francis, just like with Green, how impactful he is as a forward. Well, it's the same sort of impact both through the midfield and up forward. So um, just that sheer aggression, that sort of will that he can impose on a game, um, probably almost like a Green with a bit more of a defensive edge to him um, I'd say as well but he's got the same sort of gifts where he's that real contested ball he's got the aerial capabilities hits the scoreboard so um, he's got really pretty much all the gifts green has plus even possibly a little bit more so that's exciting and with a Nick Dacos he's something like I've compared him to a Zach Merritt but you could even look at him as something like say a slightly shorter Scott Pendlebury where just everything he does as class just has that same sort of evasion movement you just can't really catch him with the ball and he does everything so well. So he's got all the time and space. So, yeah, and plus also he's got the forward of center craft on top of that. So um, mm. likewise, the very exciting player. Yeah, I was going to say, you must be a pretty excited Collingwood fan um, based on that description as well. In terms of Horn Francis, obviously, um, for those who don't know, Dacos is a father-son, so uh, realistically, any any club pouncing on him is, um, you know, it's virtually zero. Collingwood are pretty much committed to, in fact, I think there's a contract already <laughs> in place yeah, for Dacos. already said they'll match any bids. So it could be exactly. pick one bid, they're going to match it. So, yeah, but, um, it exactly. Like that all. That, yeah. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but in terms of Horn Francis, obviously we've heard about some certain clubs, uh, Adelaide and Richmond reportedly trying to trade up with uh, mega mega offers. I think Adelaide have offered two top five picks for a Horn Francis. Where do you sit on that? Do you think that is a, um, a a good strategy on their behalf, knowing that two top five picks would net you most players in the competition who are established, or you'd almost think? But um, yeah, where do you sit on that? Um. I don't think there was really any offer that was ever really strong enough, honestly, to be considered by North Melbourne. So um, the thing with pick one and pick ones are typically overrated as a concept. If you look through all the drafts prior, really, you've got a lot of the time pick one isn't nearly the best in the draft. So um, and, and that often sort of comes about because you've got a player joining a team that usually isn't very good, doesn't necessarily have the core of veteran leaders or established players to necessarily aid in their development. But um, yeah, look, with a Horn Francis, and if I'm con to compare it to players in that range, I think it's a really hit or miss range. So picks in that range, if I had pick one, wouldn't appeal to me too, too much, honestly. So um, in North Melbourne's situation, I wouldn't be moving pick one for a combination of picks. I'd really want an absolute star, and then I'd have to see what else I'd really want. So um, yeah, I wouldn't be moving that. But yeah, great strategy, obviously, for those clubs wanting to move up. Good thinking and good try, but that need to come to the table with more to realistically get that done. Yeah, interesting, interesting take. I think uh, Adelaide in particular obviously want uh, the the marquee South Australian talent um, who's going to, because that's probably something their, their list lacks uh, as an outsider's view. They've got some solid young talent, but not necessarily the next, you know, Petrarca or Oliver type that, uh, that you can see guiding them to the next flag. In terms of the father-sons, we've got Dacos and Darcy. Where do you anticipate bids come from them? Is it as simple as two and three? Yeah, most likely. Um, and with GWS, they really want tolls. Um, so, look, it's possible they go Darcy, then maybe they go for whether it's a Mac Andrew, Josh Gibker, someone else. But um, logic would dictate with Dacos really being the clear, if he's not number one, certainly number two, you'd think that bid on him. But we'll have to wait and see. If a bid doesn't come from GWS, certainly Gold Coast will have to, you'd think so. Yeah, that's yeah. Sort of the rough situation. But Darcy, yeah, GWS with either pick two or three. Certainly, depending on if they wanted to bid on Dacos first. But I think with Collingwood sort of almost gifting the Giants that pick, maybe they're lenient to Collingwood. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, cool. So we got a question from Matty C, who uh, uh, wanted his question submitted for this podcast. And he says, uh, he asks, have you heard the suggestion that Josh Ward, currently a top five to 10 talent in this year's draft, uh, the Victorian midfielder, that he may have indicated he wants to stay in Victoria? And uh, furthermore, do you think it is acceptable that young Victorian players make these comments? Hmm. Um, it's one of those where, look, players ultimately, if they don't want to be somewhere, after two years, they're going to request a trade anyway. So it's one of those things where I guess Australians aren't used to necessarily moving into state. They obviously want to, for the most part anyway, stay in their home state. Um, it's not a desirable look, but um, yeah, look, if, say, a ward is considered the best available at, let's call it Fremantle's pick, at their first pick, um, then it would certainly make sense for them to take it. And then 
it's it's a bit like an Adam Chera situation a, a few years on, then if he's good enough, well, they can always sort of trade him for a profit. Um, but yeah, look, not a good look. It's not what you want to see. But um, if that does prove to be the case, then it sort of is what it is. I don't know really how you can sort of sanction against that. But um, yeah, it's one of those sort of unfortunate aspects of the draft. But um, yeah, there's always ways to trade them out later on. So I, I wouldn't necessarily avoid picking him, even if there is that sort of, I guess, whether it's a rumour, whatever it is. Yeah. Mm. But yeah. It's one of those where I, I try and stay out of those debates as much as possible. I'm really more of a, I guess, a- analyst of what's going on. I'm just really a game watcher more than anything. So. Yeah, fair enough, mate. Yeah, it, it is a tough one. Um, Fremantle in particular, as you used the example, have bled players out going the other, other direction. Some of them not even Victorian or not even going back to their home state. But um, yeah, it, it, I, I guess it could be seen as sort of draft manipulation a little bit where the players sort of just want to stay in Victoria and therefore they're compromising the draft in order to get there. The other flip side of it is, if that is honestly how the player feels, then it's probably better that Fremantle, for instance, get that heads up so that they don't necessarily invest in a player who's just going to leave in a few years. But um, it is good that, you know, if, if Victoria is the source of where players, you know, say they don't want to leave Victoria, it's good that there's at least 10 clubs there. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? If it was just, you know, one mega club in Victoria profiting from it, 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 would, it wouldn't make sense. But and I, I think it's also, uh, as a little tangent, uh, a good sort of reason why players who come out of contract at, you know, years two and four don't walk out as free agents. They have to get traded for as well, like you said. So there's mechanisms in place for uh, Fremantle, for instance, to get compensated in the same way that Adam Chera um, got, you know, pick six in return. And ultimately, there have been players in the past where it's been rumoured they want to come home. Um, even looking at Fremantle, I believe David Mundy earlier in his career, he wanted to come back to, I think he was from Victoria. So he wanted to leave anyway, in any case. And um, he's stayed and he's had an incredible long career. So, um, look, you do have those stories where they change their mind. And some clubs are just that good at sort of integrating players, making them feel comfortable. So um, you just never know at the end of the day. And if you're a successful team, if you're a winning team, if you've got that good culture where people want to stay, then that certainly helps in that equation. And you can feel a bit more confident in, I guess, bringing someone over. So, Let's talk again about um, divisive players, the players that necessarily, uh, or, or in, by some are rated really highly and by others not so much. So in other words, they've got a, a broad range of, of where they might land in a draft or where they're ranked as such. A couple of examples of these include Ben Hobbs, uh, Matthew Roberts, and uh, to a lesser extent, uh, Matthew Mac Andrew as well. Who do you think is the most divisive player in the draft pool and why? I would probably go Mac Andrew, actually. Um, mm. And the reason being, there's some that would actually go as far as to say he's the best haul in the draft. So some even view him that I've spoken to even above the Sam Darcy, which for me is staggering because Darcy's an incredible key position player. Had one game where he kicked six goals and just everything was going his way. But um, yeah, look, some love Mac Andrew on that level, and then others would have him outside their first round. So, um, yeah, so I think he's really the one where, I guess because he's got that skinny profile, um, incredible leaper in the ruck and has the soft hands, but he's someone where really he can get pushed around, and if you block that run and jump at the footy, then it does make life a bit harder for him. So uh, there's sort of a few reasons there, but he's someone where he's really got a great sort of combination of all-round talent where he's got the long arms, strong mark, great skills, good at ground level, moves really well for someone of two metres. So you've got all those components, but there's concerns about his strength, how he develops. Um, but look, I, I think he'll be pretty good in the long run, but he's just someone that really needs those years, probably developing first as a key position player before, I guess, transitioning to become that high-leaping dominant ruck, potentially. So. Yeah, interesting. I think that's probably his scope is, or range is probably compounded by the fact that he's a, he's a ruckman. And as we sort of alluded to before, you, you might have different philosophies on where rucks should be drafted um, as such. But um, do you also think it's a little bit of a concern, perhaps? I think he was listed at about 70 kilos. Um, is he's actually gained weight. So some might actually view him as a, a genuine key position player, um, given mm. some of his capabilities. But um. Yeah, look, he was at 70 kilos at the start of the year, and that's what I've had him in my official measurements as. But I believe he's around at probably 77, 78 now because he has been on a weights program, diet program, just to really sort of, I guess, start bulking up, realising that obviously his strength was a problem. So, um, yeah, he's, he's on his way. And look, he's got a later year birthday as well. So um, there's still a heap of development in him. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
Mm. Yeah, it's right. That, yeah, you do have those question marks certainly. For sure. And again, it's also compounded on, um, you know, in terms of where he falls on the actual draft is uh, influenced by which clubs actually need Ruckman. So GWS are uh, linked to needing a young Ruck as early as four. Um, But then there's some teams, you know, in that five to 10 range, you know, Fremantle, for instance, who've got two picks, probably really don't need a young Ruck. So that's why his range could could be... um, could be sort of scattered a little bit. Um, ben Hobbs is another one. If I'm not mistaken, do you? I think you had him about 18. Does that sound right to you? I've yeah, I've right. had him sort of in and out. So he's someone I'm really sort of mixed on. So I could have him around 10. I could have him later in sort of the first round, roughly. So he's someone where look, his skills aren't great and he's not a great mover. So those are my relative concerns. But in saying that, he's got the competitiveness. He can win his own ball, finds a heap of it, strong tackler able enough around the ground um so i guess is he going to be say a matt crouch if he is that's a good outcome um is he going to be a luke dunstan that's still a decent enough outcome um for me dunstan's actually fairly underrated but it's sort of hard to place and and that's where i get back to the evenness where after at least in my own rankings after about the first six maybe seven it's just so even that i could either have a hobbs at let's call it eight or i could have him at 21 so mm. um it's just really splitting hairs for me so um but in in saying that hobbs is generally regarded closer to around the you could call it four to ten range generally um and it's just a lot of people really like his competitiveness and i guess they look at him as a pretty sure bet as someone who can play early and is pretty capable and i don't necessarily disagree but i'm just querying his upside a little based on some limitations there with the skills and i guess relative lack of pace and agility interesting yeah matthew roberts is almost the sort of opposite example i feel whereas i think you've still got him at about seven if i'm not mistaken whereas it seems to be that other people sort of having him fading away a little bit do you think again it's just a product of it's just so even within that range with a roberts i'll definitely be moving him down based on his late season form um i'll probably still have him inside the top 20 but again he's one of those where He's almost now into that range where it's just part of that even group. So um, he could really be in that same bucket with a Hobbs based on my rankings where who would I rate higher? Not sure. Um, Roberts, he started off the year just like a house on fire. We're in the sand four under 18s. He was getting his 35 disposals, probably a couple of goals. So absolutely dominating. Got hurt um, during the middle of the season, came back later. Was only okay in the Sandfort League level, but he's a midfielder and he was asked to play forward wing. Didn't look as good. Um, but yeah, for him, the problem is, I guess, decision making's pretty poor and um, some of his, he just and just not really lowering his eyes. He just needs to really look for those lead up targets rather than just blasting long. So there's some deficiencies there. He has the performances on the board. So, um, but I do think he'll drop. I think he's probably going to be a second rounder, um, could even be a third rounder potentially. Um, so there could he could be a value pick. Um, but yeah, I'd still rate him probably 15 to 20 at this stage, I'd say. Just top of mind without sort of yeah. reading my power rankings together. So I'd still be pretty comfortable picking him. I think there could be value in the second round. Yeah, interesting. And sorry if it's a bit awkward where I'm just sort of sitting here picking apart your rankings and getting no, you to, okay. to yeah, explain no, them. But no, yeah. Yeah, uh, Josh Kivkis is another one here for me who is kind of a fascinating one. I think you've got him sort of in that sort of late teens uh, part of the draft as well. Uh, in Sorry, in terms of your rankings, but I think in your, your mock, you might have had him at GWS to pick four. So again, another player that's uh, divided probably partially by the fact that it comes down to which clubs need a, a key position defender as well. What are your thoughts on Kivkis? Yeah, so there seems to be a consensus that he's by far and away the best key defender in the draft. And his view pretty universally really as a top 10 pick. But he's one where I liked him early in the season where he was really launching for intercept marks, has a great leap. And when he sort of focuses on that intercepting component of his game, I find quite good. But I found after that, he had some games forward, looked lost, looked uncomfortable, just really didn't look good. And then he had other games where he'd play a really lockdown role and there was no intercepting or rebounding component. So I was a bit worried for sort of how his game looks. So I, I still think there's a pretty good chance that he'll be a good footballer and a capable key defender, but I'm not necessarily seeing his upside being as high as Ali Kalir. So um, with Ali Kalir, you've got an even higher Ali, much better intercepting capabilities. So, um, and you've also got the incredible rate of development, even though he's the two years older, I don't think that's really going to matter. So 
Um, but yeah, with a Gibkiss, I'd be pretty comfortable picking him if he was available around that 20 mark. But um, top 10, I'd be pretty nervous. I think there's better midfielders in that range that will have better careers. Certainly. Interesting. We've got a, a question from Chris, a uh, friend of the channel as well, who's a Fremantle fan, and he's uh, a little concerned because Fremantle has been linked to a Gibkiss when they don't necessarily need a key defender. But he, he wants to know, in your opinion, does Gibkiss have any forward line ability? Um, absolutely none. I would not pick him <laughs> as a forward. Um, look, absolutely lost as a forward. Don't do it. So um, for, to put your um, Fremantle fan at ease, um, I think he'll be taken well before Fremantle's pick, so I wouldn't be too concerned there. Um, I think whether it's a GWS or Gold Coast, um, they're probably the more likely destinations, probably one or the other, pick him up. But I, I don't think Fremantle would be a likely destination. Um, I, I think they're pretty comfortable with their key defenders. And yeah, I don't think Gibkiss will be there anyway, nor of interest. So, yeah. Interesting. I'll yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be comforted by that. Um, Josh Sin. So th this is a player that um, putting my Eagles cap on for a second. I think we've I've read that you know we've interviewed him four times, uh, and I don't even know if that's you know above average for a player that's going to go in that range anyway, or if we're actually genuinely interested in him. But as a result, I have taken um, a bit more of an interest in Sin, and I actually really do like his skill set as a really um, sort of a attacking and fast and um, relatively good ball user, or at least an aggressive ball user. Do you? Uh, it seems like his ranking at the start of the year has fallen away compared to what it is now. Uh, or sorry, the, the reverse. It's fallen away as the year's gone on. Why do you think that is? Sure. So coming into the season, he was hyped based on, I guess, what he was doing at the younger level. So obviously there was no Victorian footy last year, but based on what he'd done prior, very much hyped. Um, and all coming into the season, he looked pretty good. He was really aggressively taking on the game with his run. Aggressive kick, as you say, where he can really, I guess, open up the game his kicking sometimes but it's really that run that's almost that best ingredient but then sort of after that after a few games got her I think it's hamstring and ankle if I remember correctly so he's had a few injuries that have held him back and sort of I guess impacted on him and look when he's played he hasn't looked quite on the level that I was hoping I was hoping probably for a bit more of a contested component I wanted to see what's he look like through the midfield there wasn't really that opportunity or at least in the games I've seen where he's really just been that driver sort of from deep in defence, really, I guess, taking on the game with the run. So it's really been those running components that have excited me. Um, but with West Coast, um, one thing I've noticed, and there is actually probably some validity to the theory of Sin joining West Coast, um, is West Coast have a tendency to pick players who, in years past, have been really good performers. So that have really dominated in the under-16 ranks, under-17s and what have you. So, um, And with Sin having that reputation before this year, He's one of those where I'd say he's a plausible pick for West Coast, so um, based on their drafting tendencies. Yeah, I think the big example of that's probably Jared Brander, and obviously that didn't work out so well. Yeah, so and you've had Darling, you've had Tom Swift, who was considered one of the best 16-year-olds ever. True. Um, you had Edwards. Like, there's just so many where I just look at all these drafts and sort of half the players, and I'm finding on a level more than any other club, you really look at, I guess, those that have gone really well in years past. So mm. it's... um. That's an interesting thing, but something to keep note of if you're a West Coast fan. Yeah, that's quite fascinating. I think as well, it just the skill set of someone like a Sin, and again, I'm talking this rumor into existence. I don't actually know if we're going to take him, but um, I think just the, the leg speed in the back half is something we lack. We, we have good ball users generally, um, and our ball movement when we're playing well, which hasn't been the case for a while, um, is quite devastating. So I feel like he, he fits the mold and he adds something we don't have. But I think many Eagles fans, including myself, would really want this to be a midfielder, this pick. Um, so I was going to ask, do you think he has scope as a wingman or a midfielder, but you said he didn't really get that opportunity? Yeah, he hasn't really had the opportunity. So for me, it's a question mark. Can he play midfield? Um, some that have seen him in younger age groups say yes, and very good midfielder. But I really just haven't seen that contested component to say with any level of confidence he could be a midfielder. And on the outside, I look at him more as a speed athlete, probably more than an endurance athlete. I haven't seen any of his testing data to confirm that but I'm not sure on the outside he'd necessarily find as much as I would like in that sort of role so I do think he'd be best suited just creating that drive off half back where he's one of those guys where you just put the ball in his hands and get out the way and just let him run and generate drives so that's how I've seen him at his best at least so that's pretty much how I'm projecting at this point yeah I love that you that's never a... say never I wouldn't shut the door to midfield or wing options sure. but um certainly at this stage I'd say more defender Mm, that's really good insight. There's another WA boy I want to talk about, Jai Amos, and we've talked about how there may be a lack of, um, 
of key forward talent in, in this draft. You said you would sort of recommend going a, a, away from key forwards in this draft. Amos is probably, after Sam Darcy, if I'm not mistaken, probably the highest rated or at least projected yeah, to go highest. Definitely. Do, do you think he's a genuine key forward? Because I've heard sort of speculation, and I think you yourself actually compared him to, to a Gunston type, despite being, you know, 196. Is he? Does he have the scope to be the main man at AFL level, or is he a bit more of a lead-up type? Um, he is stylistically more a lead-up target, but you can still probably get away with that. So it's about a 195. Um, I've heard him most recently measured in that, so that's reasonable. Yeah. And he's someone where, look, he hasn't really been part of the development programs much, so... I guess his upside is a bit of an unknown and something where there's quite a lot of curiosity in the draft community. So um, this year was his first year, I believe, in the um, Waffle Colts, um, and he had a phenomenal year, but he comes from Bustleton, so um, 200 plus Ks away, obviously, from Perth, so hasn't really necessarily been in that sort of formal training program, hasn't always been able to be there. So it's exciting thinking about what he could be in an AFL environment. So currently stylistically more a lead up forward, but there could be quite a bit of untapped upside, untapped upside where, look, maybe he can actually be that genuine number one option because that's how he's been played this year. But he's also had really good sort of ball use coming through to him um, in the Colts and he's looked really good on the lead. So that's how he's got a lot of the supply. But we'll have to wait and see how it develops and if he can add additional components to his game, which he very well may. Yeah, interesting. Uh, he is a deadly kick at goal as well. Even some of the highlights, he kicked 51 goals, 15, but some of the highlights of the degree of difficulty of some of those goals were actually quite impressive as well. And I think Fremantle fans in particular are kind of hoping that he can become that key forward target because that's something they kind of lack uh, both, you know, in the short term and the long term at this stage. Let's talk about some academy picks because um, you you've, you rate a couple of these guys highly. In particular, there's, there's a couple of St Kilda ones, uh, Windhager and Owens. Uh, you're a big fan of Owens based on your, your rankings. Where, where do you anticipate bids for these guys come coming? Um, so Owens, there could be interest in the 15 to 20 range. So it's not certain that St Kilda will secure him. So obviously for St Kilda, they would be relying on a bid outside that sort of top 20 to be able to get him. So... Um, yeah, we'll have to see there. I think he's probably a late first to second rounder. So um, St Kilda, we'll have to wait and see what happens there. Um, with a win, Hager, though, I think he's probably a second to third rounder. So they should be able to match him pretty fine. Yep. And uh, I hope I'm saying this correctly. Is it Fahi or Fahe from GWS? So he's going to yeah, get some interest. Yeah, the pronunciation. So my apologies. Again, I'm more of a game watcher. But um, yeah. yeah, he's someone where, look, he had the one great game where it was the um, academy game against Geelong's VFL side, where he actually won sort of the honours for best for the um, the under 18, under 19 academy group. Um, so generates a lot of drive from defence. But um, yeah, he's someone, I'd say probably second round could get late first round interest, but I think he's more of a second rounder. So I think um, but look, with GWS, it doesn't really matter. They can match wherever it comes. It's that's, different to Gen Academies. That's very true. That's very true. Um, there's Jesse Motlop as well, who's a player that I've grown to really like. His name's Jesse, and he does a podcast, so he's uh, he's made a good start as well. But um, but he's actually you know a player that I've grown to like. He's a Fremantle Next Generation Academy prospect. Uh, should a bid come outside the top forty, if I'm not mistaken, do you think he gets that far? I think he could be a second rounder. So yeah. um, I'd say, look, there's still a chance he gets through, but there has been a lot of interest in recent years in those sort of, I guess, pressure crumbing forwards. So, um, and look, he's played at um, league levels. So look, it's not certain that he gets through. There's a chance, but I'd say probably against the odds would be my thinking at this stage. Love that. Jack Avery now is a player that uh, he's actually been on this podcast. We haven't had too many players on this podcast, but uh, the week before the draft um, happened last year, uh, we had him on and he's a great young fellow and he's had a great year playing for Perth firstly in the, I think it was Colts and Rezies, but then he played some league footy as well. Colts and then up to league and in the Colts, he was actually the leading disposal getter, incredibly playing off half back, which is phenomenal. I think he was going for around 35 a game and then up at league level, just naturally fit in just like hand in a glove sort of stuff. So, um, yeah. yeah, he's had a really good year and is someone that I've had in my power rankings and certainly will remain in my extended power rankings. So, I love that. I think you've got... Draft later rookie. Yeah, cool. I was going to say, like, you, you got a bit of attention for, for putting that highly because it was kind of out of nowhere for a player that didn't get drafted the, the previous year. But um, I was stoked to see it as a, as a fan of Jack as well. Um, do you, It's a hard question when we're talking about later rookies, but um, do you think he gets drafted or do you think it's kind of 
you know, hard to pick. 50 50. Hard to say. Yeah. But if he is picked, it'll be later as a rookie. So yeah. that would be the range to look at him. But um, certainly, if I had to pick in that range, I'd be very comfortable getting him. So probably is more that third tall defender, whereas that sort of taller, he's played key defense and he actually played really well against Tyler Keitel, who's the best key forward in the waffle. Um, mm. and really sort of negated his influence. But at the same time, he's got those, I guess, intercepting capabilities, finds a heap of it. Um, probably needs to clean up his kick, where just the kicking action's a bit awkward. There's a bit of inconsistency there, but um, I don't know how he's going to find a way to fix that up. But perhaps if a Hawthorne, who just seemed to make everyone into good kicks, if they drafted him, I think they could make him into a great success. So, um, yeah, I think Hawthorne would be remiss to not at least discuss him. Mm, I like that. Yeah, I could see Avery sort of fitting in really well at a, at a club with a, a good system, a, a good play style as well with his skill set. Um, an Eagles board favourite on Big Footy, I have to uh, acknowledge them, uh, is it's Angus Sheldrick at the moment because of his, uh, his, his, his form against it. South Australia. Um, yeah, I was going to say, what, what do you generally make of him? What's his scope and ceiling, do you think, and how high could he go in the draft? Um, how high he could go... Probably, I'd say, second round is the most likely. Could sneak in the first round, could be third round. I think his range is pretty open just because his skill set isn't great. Um, but what he does have, obviously, he's that absolute competitor, contested bull, has the burst of speed out of stoppages. So there's a lot of ingredients there where I just love. And um, there have been particular games that have stood out to me. So whether it's the game against Jason Horn Francis, where he actually won the matchup against Horn Francis and relegated him to playing forward, which... For me, it's just the most hysterical thing with Juan <laughs> Francis dominating at Sanford League level. So um, being that level of competitor, being able to do that really took my attention firstly. But then watching him in the Colts grand final as well, where like he was just copping so much during the game, so much attention, just knocks everywhere. He was on hands and knees, copped a knee to the ribs. Just <laughs> They were going to that sort of unsportsmanlike level. And yet he was, even though it was a losing game for him, it was probably the best of field for me. So... I'm just being that level of competitor. I've got a lot of respect for him, and I'll. This is probably a bit of an early hint, but I'll have him inside my top 20 power rankings when wow. that comes up for November. So I, I personally really rate him, but I think he goes later than I'll be having him. So but yeah, really. Yeah. Late. That's a that's a really big endorsement actually. He's a he's a funny one where he's so so nuggety. Like he's one seventy nine and I think he's listed at eighty eight kilos, which is uh that's heavier than me and I'm six foot three. Um, so that is enormous. I I do maybe wonder if do you think there's a lack of physical development there that could hinder him at the next level? But then again, I think if you're such a competitor, you're probably held in good stead anyway. There have been some big body players who have been really incredible. Whether it's a Clayton Oliver, Oliver mm. Wines, Patrick Cripps, like there's some big boys with big bodies where Daniel Rich even, like, doesn't really matter too much, where I guess you'd calculate in relatively less upside and physical development, but um, is one where you just almost draft him on what he's doing already and is, for me at least, pretty well good enough already and he doesn't need to improve too, too much to really be that standard of football, where he was averaging, I think, in the finals for the Colts, it was two goals a game. So, um, and during the chance, he was top for contested possessions, I think top for disposals as well. So, um, yeah, he's already got that game where I think he's really advanced and could play next year, honestly. Cool. We, we've got a question here from, uh, again, Matty C, and he wants to know your opinion uh, in terms of comparing two bigger bodied midfielders or prospective midfielders in uh, what I would suggest is probably around the teens range, specifically Mitch Nevitt and Josh Goda. How would you compare and contrast those players and who do you think becomes better in the long run? Okay, I'd go Nevitt the best in the long run and also the best as a midfielder. So with a Gota, he's more established actually across halfback. Um, he's had a little taste through the midfield, but he hasn't even been finding as much of the footy through the midfield as he has across halfback. So um, to develop that midfield craft, it'll take a bit of time. Whereas with a Nevitt, what I really like is actually taller is about a 194 versus a 190. Um, but he also showed that improvement. And I know the Victorian season was shut down early, but... um. Just the improvement he showed in, I guess, that last month or so of games where I just really like that rate of improvement. It's usually a really good indicator that more improvements to come. So, um, yeah, I'd go Nevitt. I just really like, he's got the ball winning, but he'll stand up through tackles, um, strong contested mark. He can go forward of centre. Um, so there's a lot of tools there that I'm really liking that suggest he'll be a really good midfielder. Whereas with a Goda, not he could become a midfielder, but not sure, but probably more a halfback, I'd be saying. So... 
Interesting. Yeah. Goat is one that's caught my eye and I think it's probably the, the athleticism, you know, when it, uh, when I look at, not that I'm as well versed as yourself, but when I look at a guy, um, in terms of can he play midfield, I look at, um, how, obviously how does he read the play, but his distribution by hand as well. And that seems to be things that Goda seems to do fairly well. And on top of that is agility and his explosiveness as well. Do you, would you agree that Goda has a high ceiling or do you not necessarily read him that highly? Yeah, but the highest ceiling. Um, okay. Because he's taller, he's got more weapons, he's got the contested marking. He can distribute very well by hand as well. But yeah. I, I just see with midfielders, if there was one key that converts pretty consistently, it's that contested ball winning component. If mm. you've got that, you're going to be good. So if we look at the greats, whether it's a Dangerfield, a Dusty, they've all got that, a Petrarca, a Bont. And Bont, interestingly, didn't have that as a junior. But um, if they've really got that high-end contested side, that's the one thing. And if you add weapons on top of that, that's when you're going to get a really good footballer. And I look at a Nevitt where if you've got that contested side, you stand up through tackles, you can push forward and take a contested grab. And he moves really well for 194, where he's got the speed, agility, endurance, um, I think he's going to be a really good midfielder, potentially. Um, yeah. So here's one where I'd almost consider... I probably won't have him in my top 10 power rankings, but I very easily could. So whereas with a Goda, I, I may have him around the 20 mark or just outside. So in a rough feel. Interesting. And it seems like we're getting closer and closer to the day of the two-meter midfielder. <laughs> we had Nick Cox is playing a bit of there and and uh, now never at 194. It's, uh, they're getting enormous... Um, and the cool thing there is, just to stop you there, um, I think we're actually going to see that day pretty soon where, mm. like, as long as they've got those ground-level capabilities where they can win their own ball, they're good below the knees, I think that's a very possible vision. And as long as they can move as well, spread from the contest, they're going to be fine. And we're finding with taller players more and more so, they've got the small men skills where they move like smalls, they can use the ball like smalls, they've got the ground-level craft. So I think we're going to see that. So I know it might sound silly to say, but I think we will be seeing two meter midfielders genuinely. So yeah, exciting that's, times. That's wild. Yeah, when you got uh, Paddy Cripps, I think is uh, either officially, officially, officially or unofficially about one ninety six. Yeah, so um, that's scary times. Um, we got a question here from Chris again. Um, he's a, he's a big fan of the draft. He says, uh, should in your opinion, should the draft age be lifted to 19, given that half the draft pool is completing studies and the other half is not? What are you, what are you, what's your take on um, generally the draft age? Um, for me, this is one where I'm, I don't have too strong of an opinion, but I'd probably keep the age as is. So in the past, we've actually had the draft age even younger, where there were times where it was if you were born in the first three or four months and even before that, the first six months of sort of that year before, you could actually get drafted and that's been moved back where you'd have to sort of be 18 by the end of that sort of draft year. Um, but for me, look, I probably wouldn't change that. But the one thing I would advise is the clubs to look a lot more to, I guess, whether it's your overages, your mature ages, I think that's a really untapped opportunity. And this is an article actually upcoming for ESPN that I'll be doing where I'll actually be exploring, if we look back at the players that have been, or the mature ages that have been picked inside the top 15 over the last 20 years even, they've only been two. And if we look back at every draft over that period, there is at least one every year that I would say is a clear top 15 player, if not some years two or three. So I think actually it's a missed opportunity by AFL clubs not to be paying more attention to mature age talents. And that's actually something this year you'll find with my next power rankings, which is a bit of a teaser. Um, I'll actually have a few mature ages a lot higher than anyone else in the country probably will. So, um, yeah, so I might stir up a bit of things there, but... Um, yeah, I think there's really genuine opportunities in, I guess, more mature ages. Where you look at some of the great ones, where whether it's a Sam Mitchell, Aaron Sandilands, Brian Lakers, overages, um, it's just if you go through all the names and those that are even those years older, whether it's a Tom Stewart, whether it's a Tim Kelly who are both five years older, they've actually got more upside than you'd expect, and they can be among the very best in the draft. And if you compare their actual draft position to how good they are in hindsight, it's just such a huge disparity that. It's just an untapped opportunity, plainly put. So, that's true. Yeah, Isaac Smith and Blaine Boakhorst. <laughs> um, the one miss, but yeah, too many misses relatively. No, that's so true. Probably only he and Dean Towers, top of mind, relatively weren't for those picks sort of top twenty-five have been the relative misses. But yeah, just late draft, rookie draft, so many opportunities and so many guys. Like I can just look at the waffle. You might watch some 
waffle, but the likes of, say, whether it's a Jai Bolton or Hayden Sloyth, for the last four or five years, they've been AFL quality, and they're just not getting picked up. So that's a real shame for them. But for me, they could be, across so many teams, genuine best 22 players. So um, you've got those guys running around every year. So yeah, it's a shame for them, but I think it's a missed opportunity by clubs, honestly. That's an interesting um, little tangent there. I want to ask you about it. Is what, what do you think it is that separates these mature ages from other mature ages? Do you think, is it simply that the recruiters maybe look at these players and they don't have an AFL quality, whether it be like their athleticism or probably, you know, skill, like uh, foot skills in particular? Because we see, um, like, um, uh, he's escaping me, the, the fella Parker that um, from South Fremantle that is now at Richmond. You know, it's, it's funny to me that he's playing for, for Richmond or Amalian Pickett was playing for Richmond when a Hayden Schleuth or a Jai Bolton are continually the best players in the waffle. They don't get picked. Do you, do you have a theory on why? I think it's really down to age. And funnily enough, um, the year Tim Kelly got drafted with pick 24, I think it was actually Sleuth who was his teammate who won the Sandover medal for the best in the comps. So when that sort of stuff's happening, you know there's something going wrong there. But I think it's really clubs overly focus on age demographics where they're just so focused on that, that they just miss the opportunities where they can get genuine best 22 players from outside the AFL, where it's like, if you could get a 30-year-old Dustin Martin, well, of course you'd do that. So, like, it's really you almost need that focus a bit more so on improving your best 22 at all costs, whereas I find the focus is just too much on let's have enough of this particular positional type or players in this particular age group given where we're at as a list. I think probably the focus is a little bit off that sort of, I guess, winning focus that clubs should have, relatively speaking. And I think, again, with that, there's opportunity to improve. Yeah, I like it. Now, I agree with what you're saying. And Schleuth, he's actually a mate of mine as well, so maybe I'll get him on the podcast and he'll tell me all about that uh, that Sandover medal as well. Um, cool. So um, I guess we're sort of coming towards the end of the pod. You've alluded to a couple, but do you think, um, do you care to nominate a few potential diamond in the rough type from this year's draft who are considered you know, to go pretty late, who, who you think might actually become really good players? Yeah, so um, keeping on the topic of mature ages, I think um, Rogers, Bailey Rogers, Sandover mm. medalist, I think he would be an absolute bargain for a club. Um, he's someone where I really rate him, whether it's his midfield craft, forward of centre, he's played in defence and been really good as well. But I think he's just the lock and load best 22 player and someone that I'm not aware of anyone much talking about him. So... Um, yeah, he could be considered probably more in the later draft region, maybe mid-draft if there's a club that's enthusiastic. But he's someone where I think is a genuine, probably best 20 talent in this draft, honestly. And again, I'm actually considering him for my top 20 power rankings and I'm making a final assessment on whether I'll have him in there and if so, how high. So, um, But he's in that range where you could have him almost, like it's an even 8 to 40 range just about, so you could have him really anywhere in there. But um, he's one where I genuinely have in there and I think will be better than a lot of midfielders that are rated more highly. Um, you've got Lee Kalir, who he could be a second rounder, I think is probably a top 10 talent, honestly, if you look at it in hindsight. So I think it's really, again, those mature ages that are the real value opportunities. Um, so yeah, they're two top of mind. Um, and, and again, we've already mentioned Sheldrick, where I think he's probably first round quality. I think he'll be a top 20 player to come out of this draft. And again, he's probably a second, maybe third rounder. So you've got that sort of opportunity. And then again, another of your favorites, Jack Avery. If I've got a late pick, he's someone I'd be very comfortable picking or even a rookie. So yeah, they're just a few names top of mind. I love that. That's uh, that's great insight. Um, before we wrap up, we got a couple of questions here. First of all, I just want to know, as a Collingwood fan, we haven't really talked about the Pies much at all. Um, what are you hoping to get out of this draft, other than Nick Dacos? Um, you know, are there is there uh, inform me, but like, is there a chance you guys are going to take a couple of later picks as well, or what's the deal here? So the key for Collingwood will be not trading next year's first. They <laughs> learned <laughs> the hard way this year, obviously. Um, True. But um, look, other than that, I'd be saying, I guess you just need to look for value. Um, I'd love a Lika Lear, given um, Darcy Moore is very injury prone. He probably averages top of mind something like 15 or 16 games a year, which given all the finals Colin would have played just really isn't enough. And then you've got a Jordan Ruffett who's a 30-year-old. So he'd be the one where I would make an absolute priority of securing and again, going back to my favourite names, I'd be really looking at a Bailey Rogers. If I can get him late draft, that'd be fantastic. So 
Um, I'd be open to moving picks from next year's draft if need be to get to particular players if I don't think they're necessarily going to make it to that next pick. Um, but yeah, certainly just retaining that first next year would be the absolute key other than securing day costs. I like it. That would be uh, interesting. And that's what makes the draft so exciting these days is the prospect of, of live trading. Because at the moment with Collingwood's picks, you don't sort of think them a, a possibility to get an Aaliyah at the moment, but obviously it can completely change if they, you know, match a bid and, you know. Yeah, they, they might can... trade out some of those picks from this year's draft and trade back in. and Exactly. Get to, maybe it's the pick before Geelong's first pick, or maybe it is that Geelong first pick, or who knows. Yes. I'd say they're a good chance to get him, or maybe with that next pick on. Yeah. You know, Obviously, you've got Henderson retired, and um, they have a tendency to pick mature ages. And they do doing it, so <laughs> yeah. I'll be exploring that in the upcoming ESPN article. So I'll oh, look if forward to it. Look forward to it. With mature ages. Cool. We got a final question from Chris here, um, and it's less so much about this draft in particular, but he says, "What pathways can lead to becoming a media draft guru?" So I guess uh, Chris is a young sort of, uh, he's massively into the draft. He's a really smart young fella, and he just, I guess, wants advice uh, from someone who's somewhat done it. Yeah, sure. So um, obviously, my pathway was big footy, and really, how I succeeded there was, I guess getting out there, doing something, um, but then also just engaging so much with people. I think that really sort of, I guess, helped build me up in some respects where it just probably got me a bit more exposure, a bit more known and a bit more interest in what I was doing. Um, but yeah, I guess for me, the key would be getting out there, doing something. So whether it's starting a YouTube channel as you've done or whether it's being on Big Footy, or maybe it's reaching out to the um, AFL Draft Central website and seeing if you can start writing for them. I think they're probably some of the best opportunities if you want to get into the draft and talk about the draft and sort of build up a profile there. But um, yeah, I don't think necessarily you need a journalism degree. That can certainly help, but um, you do need that, I feel, sort of that experience and then it makes it a bit easier to apply for something or alternatively get noticed sometimes if you're in a niche enough area as I was at the time with no one really covering the draft back in 2009, 2010, 2011. I know Toomey was probably a few years after that. Mm. Wow, so you predate Toomey. I yeah, didn't actually so realize that. I'm, I'm not sure what year he would have started with AFL.com. I'm going to guess around 2013 or 14. So I was, I've probably got a four or five years on him in terms of watching the draft. Wow, that's uh, that's pretty fascinating. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time, Chris. It's been a, a really, really informative chat. Um, you know, for those who don't know, if you if you want some draft insight, you can either head to Big Footy in the in the draft sort of hubs sort of section, or you can find uh, Chris directly on ESPN. Actually, I'll, I'll let you do this. Where, where can people find some of your work? Do you give it all a plug? Yeah, sure. So um, on Big Footy, I have a yearly thread. So it's called Nightmares Draft Almanac 2021. So you can find all my work for ESPN there. You can engage with me directly, ask me any question. I'll get back to you. There's no one I just ignore. I just respond to everyone. Um, on YouTube, I'm AFL Draft Expert and on Twitter, AFL Draft Expert. So make sure you follow me and um, yeah, get subscribed if you haven't already on YouTube. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, go check them out, guys. Um, yeah, I've been following your work for ages, mate. So it's, uh, it's been awesome to get you on the, on the podcast as well. Um, all the best for you know, the rest of the draft. It is truly one of the most exciting times of the year. I'm sure you'll, you'll feel the same. Draft days for me is like Christmas Day, um, which is really, really sad. But um, yeah, there we go. So thanks, Chris. And uh, yeah, thanks for all the listeners. And um, obviously subscribe to both True Footy and AFL Draft Expert. Thanks, guys. We'll see you in the next one.